When you bring a p-type and an n-type semiconductor together and join them, you have a p-n junction where you have n-type on one side and p-type on the other side, as is shown here. So the n-type has donor doping and the p-type has excess acceptor doping. The energy level diagram is no longer that of a, a single piece of semiconductor, and we've talked a little bit about what it looks like when you join two pieces together. Let me uh, remind you of, of some thoughts here. Um, on the end type, the conduction band edge is brought down closer to the Fermi energy, and when you hold dope, and we have acceptor dopants, the valence band edge is brought up close to the Fermi energy. But if we're in thermal equilibrium, so no current is passing through the semiconductor, then the Fermi energy is a single horizontal line. Um, there's no quasi-Fermi energy right now because I'm not passing current through. There's no injection. The gap is preserved, right? So the, the conduction band edge and the valence band edge on, on both sides is, has the same separation. So the gap is not affected by uh, doping. Let me run through a few just sort of bullet point uh, summaries of, of this system. First of all, I'm going to assume that it's a single matrix material all the way throughout, so like a piece of silicon. This is just one bar of silicon. It was never cut in half. Nobody ever rejoined two separate pieces. It was all one piece of silicon to begin with, and then different dopants for acceptor and donor atoms were added carefully. So perhaps half of the silicon was covered and donor dopants were put on there and then half of the other half was covered and acceptor dopants were added. Uh, it was from the looks of this energy level diagram, I would say it was done uniformly. That is the distribution of donor dopants is uniform throughout and the distribution of acceptor dopants is uniform throughout the P side. But the matrix material refers to the, the native semiconductor, you know, like usually it's silicon or gallium arsenide. Uh, there's no reason to accept that the doping is uh, the same on both sides. You could have more of one type than you have of the other, and that's actually common practice. In fact, sometimes it's very different, in which case you have what's often referred to as a one-sided junction. The semiconductor is taken to be in thermal equilibrium. That's what the horizontal Fermi energy is about. Now this step from of the, the conduction band edge on the N side to the conduction band edge on the P side, you might recall we discussed it once. We called it the built-in potential, phi sub bi. Now you multiply by Q and you put in energy units that way. That's often going to also be called the diffusion voltage, and I just wanted to make sure you're aware of that and that you, you see it. Um, if you, you will come across it in the literature and you're reading, you'll come across the expression diffusion voltage. It's synonymous with built-in uh, potential. Donor and acceptor levels are shown in this, this diagram. So uh, the donor level res resides somewhere between the Fermi band uh, and the conduction band edge, and the, the acceptor levels are between the valence band edge and the Fermi energy. So the donor level means that that's the energy that a donor atom has when it's placed inside the environment of the semiconductor. And that difference, more specifically, that difference between where this dash dot green line is and the conduction band edge is the ionization energy for donor atoms. It's the energy that it takes to remove an electron from it. It's very small. Normally, the ionization energy of these dopants is a couple of electron volts, but uh, it's very small in the environment of the semiconductor, and the same for acceptor dopants. This distance between the valence band edge and the acceptor energy is the ionization energy. It's, it's all it takes to put an electron from the valence band into the acceptor. Now, once acceptors and donors become ionized, you know, they have a charge, right? Donor atoms give up an electron, so they become positive ions. Acceptor atoms take on an electron, so they become negative ions. Now, this is a very important point. You know, that's not a realistic looking diagram at all. Uh, what's unrealistic about it is that you don't have a sudden change in the conduction band edge from down here to up there. The best thing I'll just say is nature abhors a singularity. And so the, the gradient of energy is not going to be infinity ever. We'll actually have a rounding of the energy levels as you go up here, as you go up a step. Seems like a minor point to talk about, but we're going to talk a lot about it because really the way that the conduction band edge transitions from the n-type to the p-type could be argued in kind of my own egotistical uh, way as the most important scientific advancement of the 20th century because the whole semiconductor revolution is predicated on how the conduction band edge 
transitions from the n-type to the p-type that totally affects how a p-n junction functions as a device. And so we're going to have to model that. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty important. So if I have this strip of semiconductor again, n-type on the left, p-type on the right, I'm going to make several graphs. That's why this, this long line here, it goes all the way down this dashed line. Uh, it's going to be, uh, for all the graphs we make, it's going to de depict the, the interface between n and p. It, it, this, this vertical line here is x equals 0. We're going to have a lot of graphs, which is why we're in portrait mode instead of landscape mode for this. So let's start with the charge densities that are inside the semiconductor. I'll just give you a minute to, to think about the four curves you see there. You see four curves? All right, so you have the, the electron charge density, you have the hole charge density, you have the donor ion charge density, and you have the acceptor ion charge density. All four quantities are, are uh, graphed here. Now on the N side, you have a lot of ionized donors. We'll just assume 100% ionization, but you really don't need 100% ionization for what we're talking about here. So the donors are ionized. It's uniformly ionized throughout because the donors were implanted uniformly throughout. And so that's their density. Remember, donors become positive ions, so that's why it's positive. Anything above this rho equals zero line is positive charge, so they're positive. As opposed to the electrons, which are negative. Now, I also remember semiconductors are charge neutral, meaning you have as many electrons as you have donors on the N side. And so I deliberately drew that to, to look like that. And then on the P side, same situation. You know, these are your acceptor ions making a certain charge density, so many coulombs per cubic centimeter. And same for the, the holes uh, throughout. Again, it's going to be charge neutral. The thing we're, we're adding now is, is this, this interface region where the electron and hole charge densities gradually change. You know, you do get a little bit of electron charge density spilling into the P side and a little bit of hole charge density spilling into the, to the N side. Let's um, take a close-up look at that. First of all, why does it happen? All right, so suppose you are within this population of electrons. What does a population of one species do when it's all gathered into one place and the members of that species look out yonder and they see unoccupied real estate? they go. That's what diffusion is. Electrons on the N side diffuse over to the P side. Holes on the P side diffuse over to the N side. Now you might say, well, why doesn't it just keep diffusing? Why, don't, why doesn't it level off so that you have uniform electron distribution and uniform hole distribution? Dopants are fixed. They can't move. So you have a whole bunch of, say here, negative ions that are, are fixed in place. If, it, if too many electrons head over here, they're going to start to feel pushed back by all these ions. You know, you can't have all these, all the negative charge on one side and all the positive charge on the other. So you really can't get a lot of electrons over here. You have to maintain charge neutrality, but you do trade electrons and holes. And that, that's what these, this little, what looks like residual is all about here. This is not the electrons that would be there, and that's not the holes that would be there. We did that problem, remember, on the P side, the electron carrier density was like 1,000 electrons per cubic centimeter. There just aren't any. And these are here because they diffused over from over there. That's charge density. Let's look at this in terms of carrier density. Let's discuss the, this charge distribution then in this rounded off region. You, you have an accumulation of charge here. You know, in general, throughout a semiconductor, it's charge neutral. But right around this interface of the, the junction, on the P side, right next to the junction, you have a lot of negative charge from the acceptor ions not a lot of positive charge from the holes, meaning that there's a little region here that's net negative in charge. And on the N side, you have a lot of charge from the positive donors, not a lot of negative charge from the electrons. So you have a little region here near the interface that's net positive on the N side. Because the holes and the electrons are mobile they, and they can move, but the ionized dopants are not mobile, they're fixed in place, you end up with what's called space charge distribution around the interface. That word is going to keep coming up, so get that term down. Space charge. It is a, space charge is a fancy word for rho. <laughs> okay, but there is a, a net rho, a space charge distribution around the interface. Let's look at this in terms of carrier concentrations. Because 
the actual charge density is just the carrier density times charge, uh, these curves have to have the same shape. So if you take the electron charge density, uh, divide out minus Q, you have the electron carrier density. Now, there's no such thing as negative carrier density, so that's why this shows up as positive, but it, th this, these two orange curves have the same shape. Same with these two magenta curves. The whole charge density has to look like the whole carrier density, and they do. Okay, now I added these two vertical lines to the left and right of our, of our interface. And these vertical lines pretty much just sort of represent where the, the roll-off begins, roughly, sort of. I mean, a little before, but mostly. The roll-off is underway by the time you get to these vertical dashed lines. This is usually what you refer to as the junction, rather than just the interface itself. The whole region bounded by these outer, more outer uh, vertical lines is what's referred to as the junction. The carrier concentration rolls off uh, according to the mo two most equation, important equations in the book, e equation 185 and 188 in the textbook, governs this where you have you know, the conduction band edge for N and valence band edge for, for P. If you don't bias the junction, that's just the Fermi energy. Otherwise, it would have to be the quasi-Fermi energy. But it rolls off uh, according to that. So we'll, we'll be able to uh, make a graph instead of the energies. Uh, just a minute here. I want to talk about these two boundaries. They should have names. And so we'll just, they have names. The point where the n-type starts to roll off is called x sub n, okay? And the point where the p-type starts to roll off is called x sub p. I mean, that really starts. I mean, it's underway, but it's, it's uh, almost starting. Well, one thing I'd point out is they're typically not equal. The region between these two vertical dashed lines is called the depletion region, the region from x sub n to x sub p. If we take the middle vertical dashed line as x equals 0, then x sub n is technically a negative number. We just have to be a little careful how we play that. Distance between these two lines is the depletion region. Depletion because it's depleted of mobile charge carriers is depleted of electrons and holes. And in fact, in this region between these outer two vertical dashed lines, there is a net charge, positive on the n side, negative on the p side. Finally, we can uh, look in at the energy levels uh, that, uh, that, that have to also be rounded at, at the interface. And it looks just like the other previous energy level diagram, except for the fact that this rounding has been put in. E sub CP is the conduction band edge on the P side, and E sub CN on the N side, and you've got built-in potential. Nothing's really changed other than I've completed the picture by taking our discontinuous jump in energies and rounding them out. Um, okay, so what we're going to do uh, next is we're going to do some electrostatics on the junction, because if you've got space charge, if you have negative charge on the P side and a net positive charge in, this, in the depletion region on the N side, there's going to be electric fields to contend with, and we're going to use Poisson's equation to build a model of the electrostatics of a PN junction. That's next.